This is the flow rate graph. This by far, in my honest, humble, unbiased, neutral, scientifically sound, evidence-based, clinical practice-based opinion is the most important chart in Oscar. Why? Because of the amount of information that you can glean from this graph. It tells you almost the entire picture. Perhaps that's a bit hyperbolic, but you be the judge by the end of the video. So this is what you want your flow rate to look like essentially, minus these spikes, ignore these spikes, but you want it to be flat like this on the top and on the bottom. Why? Because that indicates that you have a consistency in your breaths. There's no volatility. It's not sporadic. It's not all over the place. Now, just because it is volatile in certain areas doesn't necessarily translate to there being a problem. For example, we know that when we enter REM sleep, the waveforms and volatility tends to increase quite a bit. If we zoom in here, you can see how uniform and consistent these breaths are. I'll put the zero line on so that we can see things a little bit better. So this red line is zero. Anything above it is inspiration and anything below it is expiration. Inspiration, expiration, and so on. So what you can see is that these tops are very clean and nicely rounded. That's what you want to see. When you start to have flow limitation or obstruction, these tops will look blunted and reduced uglier. So this is what you want to see. Everything about this indicates consistency. The roundedness, the space between breaths, the inspiratory and expiratory times are consistent and so on. Right below the flow rate graph, we have the flow limit graph. And the flow limit graph is an attempt to index the degree of flow limitation that we see in these breaths. So in other words, the flow rate graph and the flow limit graph are directly related with each other. The flow limit units are an index meaning there is really no units, it's just zero to one, where one represents a top that's completely flat and zero represents a top that's completely rounded. So halfway up at 0 0.5, you can kind of translate that to the waveform of your breath being half flattened. If you see flattened, reduced, and varying tops, you'll also see it being quantified down here in the flow limit graph. Now this here is something that you don't really want to see. You can see down here that it's quantifying. We have flow limit. It's not terrible. Obviously it's not an obstructive apnea. Uh, you can see it, it's indexed around, you know, 0 0.16 on the flow limit scale. And what you can see, you can see a very clear difference in the tops. You see how flat this is? And this one is kind of flat and it's choppy and it has peaks. That is all an indicative of flow limitation. You see this one is flat too, right? And remember the index value of the flow limit is trying to measure basically the flatness of the top of that waveform. What I mean by waveform is, is just a breath, right? This is These are individual breaths and they have a, a shape to them, aka a waveform. And the flattenedness of the top is being calculated by the flow limit graph. Now, here lies the secret. Here lies the entire story. What you can see here are snippets of the flow rate graph, which I was just showing you. On the top, we have an obstructive apnea. You can see we're breathing, 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 apnea, recovery breath. Here's a hypopnea. And of course the machine can't determine whether your oxygen levels are desaturating or if there's an EEG signal, the brain signal that you would get in your actual in-lab sleep study saying that you're waking up. But we can see is a more than 50% reduction in the waveform for at least 10 seconds. And then we have these recovery breaths. And we see here a respiratory effort related arousal. We have the flattened tops. It's not, they're not as flat as the hypopnea, but they're still flat, flat, flat and then we have what looks like a recovery breath. So the machine flagged this as a respiratory effort related arousal. Now it doesn't know for sure because it doesn't have an EEG signal or, or a DSAT and rears actually don't even need DSATs, but it's the best guess that it has. But then what do we call this? What do we call this top? That doesn't look like the normal perfect waveform that we were just modeling. Neither does that one. That looks kind of flat. That looks like we have, you know, two dips, flat, flat, flattish. That one looks kind of normal. That one looks kind of normal. So what do we say about all these other ones? Is there clinical significance to any of these? We just call them flow limitation. So why are all these events, the obstructive apnea, the hypopnea and the rera important, but the flow limitation isn't? Where is the cutoff? Do flow limitations matter at all? Will these cause changes in your brain signals while you're sleeping? Let's see what we can find out from the literature. 
Okay, let's have a look at this study that I found in the journal Sleep, published in 2013. The purpose of this study was to investigate how much flow limitation normal individuals can present during sleep. In order to be considered normal, they could have no known diagnosis of a sleep disorder or any sleep complaints. They took the standard sleepiness questionnaires, the clinically relevant ones. So an AHI had to be less than five, but basically these people are normal and they don't have obstructive sleep apnea slash sleep disordered breathing or, or upper airway resistance or, or, and very importantly, any complaints. So subjectively, these people didn't have any problems with their sleep either. This here is the graph of those results. The number of people included in this part of the study was 163. Frequency, this is the number of people who belong to each of these brackets. So in other words, down here you can see percent of total sleep time with flow limitation. So this bar here represents, you know, around 30 people. Out of 163 people, 30 of them had approximately, let's say 5% of the night spent in flow limitation. So the further we go to the right here, the more of the night was spent in flow limitation. So of the normal people, the most common result was basically no flow limitation. That was the most common. However, there's lots of people who did have flow limitation from a little bit like this bar around 5%. There's about 30 people who had, you know, about 5% of the night in flow limitation. And over here we can say, you know, 14 plus another 10. So 24 plus another seven, let's say. So 30, so out of 163 people, around 30 had at least 10% and up to 20% of the entire night in flow limitation. Then we have people even over here. It looks like, you know, there's one person here who had 45% of the night. So almost half the night, these two people spent in flow limitation. The mean or the average is about 8.3% of the night. So out of normal people who aren't complaining about their sleep, who also don't have objectively measurable sleep disorder, about 8.3% of the night was spent with flow limitation. So one of the takeaways of this study was that the 95th percentile was about 30%. So 95% of normal people will have flow limitation for 30% or less of the night. And therefore, the author suggested that levels of flow limitation less than 30% of the night is a normal finding. So in other words, it suggests that values above 30% could be used to support a diagnosis of sleep disordered breathing. Just as an aside, I thought some of you guys might find this intriguing. This is, remember, this is a pool of 163 people, which statistically isn't huge. So, you know, don't let this be the, the be all end all of your understanding of what normal people sleep like, but here's just a little idea. So of the normal group, remember the people who aren't complaining about their sleep and objectively they don't have any sleep disorder breathing. On average, it took them about 17 minutes to fall asleep. The maximum time was 168 minutes. Total sleep time was 336 minutes. Here's something that's kind of interesting. So on average, they had EEG arousals of about 11 per hour. So remember it is, it is in, in a lot of your sleep studies, you guys will probably see spontaneous arousals. It is normal to have spontaneous arousals in your EEG. And for this specific group, which was deemed normal in this study, the average was about 11 arousals per hour. The AHI per hour for the normal people was 1.2. The max was 1.3. The min was 1.2. The mean or average oxygen was 96.4 with the max at 98 and the minimum at 90. The lowest oxygen saturation level was 91. The average lowest oxygen level was 91.4 where the maximum of the lowest was 96 and the lowest of the lowest was 78. All right guys, thanks for watching the video. There's definitely more flow limitation stuff I wanna show you, but this video is getting long, so I'll show you in the next one. I'm still not used to this. <laughs>